a pleasure to it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I'm the state director for South Carolina First Steps. My name is Georgia Miarton, and I'll be your host today. We have a great lineup for the 2023 Countdown to Kindergarten Summit. And I want to share with you that there are over 500 people participating today. So while you can't see each other, I hope you will keep each other in your hearts. As you know, there are on the line today parents, caregivers, teachers, early childhood professionals, child advocates, and community members. All of us create that beloved community who comes around our early learners to help that transition to kindergarten be positive and smooth. And that's what today's about. Today's event is part of our annual Countdown to Kindergarten initiative. Since 2004, Countdown to Kindergarten has supported thousands of children and their families in the transition to school. We'll talk a little bit about Countdown to Kindergarten later in the program. And you can also learn more about Countdown to Kindergarten and all of the great initiatives happening across the state at countdownsc.org. Thank you so much to everyone who's putting their names in the chat. Please do keep doing that. Our two speakers today are Dr. Kelly Fraden and Dr. Kimberly Johnson. They have inspiring stories and expert advice that they'll share with us. I do wanna remind you to please keep on putting your names and information in the chat. You won't be able to speak during the presentation, but do feel free to comment. We're seeing your chats, and you can also enter your questions in the Q&A box. We have some great giveaways today, and thanks to our sponsors who we'll announce later, those giveaways will be made available to winners who are randomly selected. So you will be selected if you're present to win. You do have to be present to win, so be sure to stick around. Also, if you're an educator. You can get SC Endeavors credits for today's event. Please do remember that you must be logged in on your own device and you must attend at least 80% of the session as required by the South Carolina Department of Social Services. Throughout the summit, uh, this will be in webinar format. So your image won't show, but your attendance will be counted for those SC Endeavors credits. I do wanna give some gratitude today to the South Carolina Department of Social Services, who are a large part of the reason that this uh, is happening to get today. Together with South Carolina First Steps, uh, we are the implementers. They are the applicants for the federal preschool development grant, Birth Through Five, and that preschool development grant is funding today's uh, wonderful event. It's now my pleasure to ask Dr. Kelly Braden, to please turn your camera on. You'll be up in just a moment. Hi, Dr. Freden. It is such a pleasure to see you today. It's going to be a joy for everyone to hear from you. Our first pre presenter is Dr. Freden. She's a pediatrician and an author of two books, including a new book called Advancing, called Advanced Parenting, Helping Kids Through Diagnoses, Differences, and Mental Health Challenges. She's a mother of two and a child advocate based in New York City. She's also, because she's incredibly busy, she is also the current director of pediatrics at Atria Institute. She was inspired to become a doctor because of her own experience surviving childhood cancer. She's a graduate of Harvard College and Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons, and she has dedicated her career to caring for children with complex medical conditions and helping families navigate the challenges that come with them. In addition to sharing information in her books, Dr. Fraden shares calm, realistic, and evidence-based advice to families on her popular Instagram account, Advice I Give to My Friends. And with that, Dr. Fraden, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you. Hi, thanks so much for having me. And I'm so excited to speak with you all today. You know, I have um, been really busy because the book only came out two weeks ago. But part of the reason I was just so thrilled to be here is because I am also the mother of a rising K student. So preparing for this talk was a great um, opportunity for me to reflect on on um, on what's coming up for my family too. And I've seen um, 
I've seen the magic that happens when educators and parents, you know, collaborate to make transitions like these a successful experience. So I'm so glad to see um, South Carolina devoting resources to provide this to your community. So I'm gonna share my slides and we'll dive right in. So um, I think one, one part of being on social media as a pediatrician and a parent is that there's a lot of content out there. And, and when you Google like getting ready for kindergarten, there's a lot of, of ideas about like your child has to be able to know their colors and their letters and, and, um, and write their name and all these very like concrete tasks. Um, and I, uh, part of what I wanted to talk about right up front is when I talk to families about preparing for kindergarten, that, that is actually not what I talk about. Um, so, um, you know, it used to be, we, we would, as pediatricians around the four-year visit, we would have sort of a checklist to make sure the child was developmentally ready for kindergarten and um, test these skills. But that is really not what we do anymore because, because the truth of the matter is we know that all children need, um, need school, no matter what their skill level is, um, you know, and we want to make sure that our educational institutions welcome children at all levels. And, and so if your child uh, is getting ready for kindergarten, it, rather than focusing on their skills where they are, we want to focus on other things. And that's what I'm going to spend time talking about today. Um, so um, what, what I'll do is I'm going to start with some of the very practical stuff about uh, about having a successful experience in school um, and what I would focus on rather than these discrete skills. We'll talk about separating a lot of children who enter kindergarten maybe haven't been in a school environment before or separated from their parents. And so that can be a lot of stress um, for both the parent and child. Then we'll talk about kind of like the most important foundations we'll build on for the academics that come with school and the ways that I, one of the things I think is most important as a pediatrician to support learning and emotional regulation, which is sleep. So, so first off to think about the practical preparation. I, I have um, definitely heard from the teachers I work with that, um, you know, one teacher cannot be in charge of everyone's stuff. So we want a child to, as much as they're able to, handle them, their clothing, their shoes, their water bottles, their lunchbox. So, so it's a great time over the next three months to, to give your child an opportunity to practice these very simple skills, you know, buttons, zippers, jackets, shoes. You know, if they can't tie their shoes really well, maybe, maybe it's time for um, some slip-on shoes. Um, but thinking about even the shopping list for what your child will wear to school, it, it's good to think about things that they'll be comfortable in and able to run and play and, and really learn in because we don't want their clothing to distract them from their learning or keep them from going to the bathroom. Um, the other part of it is, is the lunch, right? So, so when you have picked out your lunch box, then you want to make sure the child can open and close any containers. And, and that they, um, they know how to use all of the things that they have. Um, if your child hasn't already been able to uh, toilet train this summer, it would be a great opportunity to get that going and to really build their confidence and their ability to manage their own toilet needs. Um, practically, I would encourage you to make sure that your child knows their, you know, their full name, your full name, your address and phone number. And while that sounds like a lot, you know, slowly but surely, if you practice with repetition, um, I'm sure you'll be able to get there by the end of the summer. Um, in a classroom environment, there's a lot going on, right? Other students and, and um and it's loud and, and sometimes there can be distractions. So one thing we also wanna teach our children to do is to speak up when they need help. So we can practice this when we go to the grocery store or when we, when we have to buy gas, to encourage your child to speak with another adult and to, to, to say things um, to other 
people is a great opportunity. You know, have them pay for the the groceries, give them the money and stand and have them ask for for what they need at the store. And those experiences will help build their confidence and their autonomy to then speak up in the classroom if they need help or they didn't hear something um, so so that they can participate independently. And, And also, if you have any concerns about your child's hearing or vision, you know, we have about three months before school gets going and we have a great opportunity to get extra hearing tests or extra extra vision tests and get those kids in glasses if they need them. Um, it's certainly quite common um, and something that will enable them to learn better. And one thing hopefully your pediatrician will talk to you about. So uh, separating in a new environment, it, it can be very hard. I've seen certainly even children who have been separating for daycare or, or to be with a babysitter, um, sometimes separating in a new place feels different. And all the buildup and excitement around a new big kid school can increase kind of the, the child's um, sensitivity during this time. So I think it's important um, to support parents in this transition and to to let them know that it's okay if the child struggles or had a hard has a hard time um that it's normal and and that if we respond to it in that way it will help the children to over- overcome it um i've seen a lot of first time parents who when their child gets upset overreact and you know are, are very worried and they're worried too. So a parent brings their own emotions to this moment. Um, so as much as possible, if we can um, can process our own emotions before drop off, that will help us be available to support our child. So just to break that down a little bit further, I think preparing a child for a transition, um, you can talk about, there's some great books. The Kissing Hand is one of my favorites where um, a little mother raccoon uh, puts a kiss in each of the raccoon's hands so he won't miss her during his school day. Uh, and if he, if he does, he can always rub the kiss on his cheek later. Uh, and Daniel Tiger has a good song uh, called Grown Ups Come Back. But these, um, these provide uh, preparation for children in a very child-centered way. Um, so I'd recommend checking out some of those resources. You want to make sure that the kids are well rested and fed and and if possible, not too rushed. I know it's impossible to get out the door with little ones, but but to budget an extra 10 or 15 minutes on those first few days to, to understand that rushing a child will increase um, sort of their fear and frustration. We want to also make sure we set a positive tone. I, I know that many parents um, feel sad when their child is going off to kindergarten because it's sort of the end of a baby era where we're very close and connected with our children. And and it's okay to be sad, but it's also um, what we want to set as the leader of the family as parents is is a a positive tone. So to talk with your child about all the good things that is going to happen by becoming a member of this new community. Uh, we want to make sure we also say goodbye um, in a quick and positive and firm way. Um, uh, you know, if the child's upset, you can show the child that that's okay, and you're sure that they'll get better by just by just leaving and stepping outside of the classroom. It's also helpful to um, send something in the backpack that is a comfort item to the child whether um, it's a photo of your family or a note uh, from you with, with a motion of love. And then if they miss you during the day, they have something they can touch and feel. So um, once we get past the, um, past the drop-off and, and the, 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 the children do get past the drop-off, even if it's a hard first day, um, the, you know, vast majority of kids within a week will be past it. And if they aren't, um, you can work with your teachers to, to help make a plan to get that back on track. Um, but but they will get past it. And um, and when they do, we're, we're wondering what skills they'll need to succeed in the classroom. So like I, I mentioned before, 
uh, there's so much focus in the United States on achievement and academic um, academics and pushing for children forward in their writing and math and their their knowledge base and and when I talk to families about this, I have to say like which skills are going to matter more at the kindergarten level. And the other set of skills that we talk about are knowing emotion words like sad, mad, having, um, you know, coping skills and navigating, playing with friends and having um, social skills to navigate communication. And so for a pediatrician, it's pretty clear that number one is more important here. I think most educators would agree that um, that the social and emotional skills children have and the self-regulation skills really set them up for academic success. So you might see that there's not much academics happening in the first month or two of a kindergarten experience. And that's not because the teachers aren't working on those skills, they'll get there. But before they can get there, we have to scaffold our children to be in the classroom environment and to listen and to, to, uh, to participate in a productive way. And that takes time uh, too. So, so you know, learning uh, different classroom jobs and different routines like like rug time. These are all like part of the ways in which teachers will set up these classrooms to be warm and welcoming spaces to facilitate the learning and the work. So, to talk more about some of these social skills, um, this is a, is a, a a chart that kind of lays them all out very nicely. So. There are, um, there's the task performance, like the ability to focus on something, the ability to persist when something's hard. Um, and and these, these task performance skills um, are, are important for being able to learn new things because we know it's hard. Um, and if you followed Angela Duckworth, she wrote an amazing book called Grit about how, uh, how our um, growth mindset sets us up to do uh, important work and achieve big things. Because um, it's very easy to, when something gets hard, want to quit. So how do we teach our children to do that? Um, we, we use words like, we can't do this yet. And we say things like, I'm still learning. And as parents, we can set, um, we can be role models for our children in this way. So if we make a mistake, instead of just being frustrated, be like, you know, you can, you can model how you talk to yourself and your child will learn to model that as well. So for example, if I spill a glass of water, uh, instead of, of being like, oh, darn, I don't know what I did wrong to do this. I can say like, I made a mistake and I can fix it and I'll go get a towel and clean it up. Or, and, and for our children, that is, um, that's an important skill to talk positively to ourselves and to persist against adversity. Children often learn this best when they're, when they're playing. So I put the picture of the kids in the blocks here to demonstrate that because it, um, when you build a tower and it falls down, you, you get mad and you can have a tantrum about it, but you will overcome these big feelings and learn ways to cope with them. And then when you encounter a, a hard math problem and you can't get it, you get frustrated, you'll, you'll use those very same skills you used when you were building your tower to, to continue on and persevere against that challenge. And, and it's, it's also important um, to understand that these skills, these social skills, don't always correspond with academic skills. So there may be kids who are um, able to do a lot of academic tasks like reading and writing um, or communicating sophisticated thoughts, but they might still struggle with these skills. Uh, and that's normal and to be expected. Um, and part of what we're doing in the unstructured playtime um, is to uh, allow them to navigate these, these tensions on their own. Um, so, so you can see some of the other skills. I'll just highlight, um, curiosity. We, we know that children learn best when it's driven by their own curiosity, just like adults, actually, when they, when they have the opportunity to investigate what they're interested in and learn from it, it, it can be, um, the best way to learn. And an example of that might be if you wanted your child to learn more math facts, 
instead of just giving them a worksheet, you might, when you're giving them snacks, say, oh, here's, here's two crackers. Do you want, do you want, how many more crackers do you want? Do you want one more or two more? Okay. Now, how many do you have? Do you have three or four? Um, and when you have your child's attention in that way, and there's a concrete thing that they can touch, they'll be more apt to, to learn the, the, the facts behind it. I think the other the other piece of this is there's a lot of trust that is required when your child transitions to the school environment. Um, and for teachers, it it is something you do every year and something you've done many times before. And you know um, you're confident in that skills. But 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 for parents, it's a leap of faith to to send your little one into a new building. And um, it it's something that, that it can be hard. Um, but to know that the educators in the school are passionate about promoting your child's well-being and they have your child's best interest at heart, and that's why they're there, it, it's important to remember that you're all aligned to be part of that, that team and that you should try to, to, to trust your teachers and to listen to their guidance. And they should also, you know, trust when you communicate things with them that that's important to you and your family and, and that mutual respect will go a long way in furthering your child's development. So um, just to talk a bit further about the power of play, um, this is uh, some quotes from a, a pediatric, uh, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a, has a whole um, publication about how important play is, because what we've seen is, is increasingly children get scheduled you know, the travel sports and this enrichment in music and enrichment in language. And, and they end up spending more time in the car going to these activities and, and less free time. Um, but the free time is really, really important for these four, five, and six-year-olds. They, uh, the free time is when they learn those skills from the last slide and, and they gain their strength and stamina. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, if we want to have some very specific things that we can prepare our children for this summer, rather than memorizing the ABCs or learning to write this summer, I'd rather your child learn um, to talk about their emotions. So to do this, you can, when you're reading a book to your child, you're watching a movie, you can point out a character and say, oh, look, what do you think, what do you think she's feeling? You know, and the child might guess and they might guess right, they might guess wrong. But, um, but if your child can name an emotion, then you can say, why do you think they feel that way? And you can facilitate a really interesting um, dialogue with your child. I think it's a lot easier to start by talking about emotions in those situations because when a child is upset, when they're crying or when they're tantruming and mad, they're, they're not able to engage in, in learning at that time and they can't use their rational brain because they're dysregulated. So, so using um, the opportunity in advance when they're calm to gain the skills is going to be the best time. Or if you do want to talk about a, a meltdown your child has, um, to do so later in the day when they're calm, to say, you were really upset before, and what do you think we could do next time to, to feel better? And, and a point two here is a few, a few ways to feel better is a really important thing to teach our children. So some some parents might choose um, whatever technique you prefer. My daughter and I, what we've done is we put our hands on each other like this and we take five deep breaths together. So we trace our hand and we do one, two. Um, and actually it's a technique that adults can use too when we get mad or, or, or frustrated because we know that when we take deep breaths, what it does is it regulates our autonomic nervous system lowers our heart rate, lowers our blood pressure, helps, um, helps take our stress hormones down. And then it allows us to, to feel better and to function better. And, and so if you can teach your child and practice those skills, because you, you, anybody can do it for five minutes with their child, but you really need to do it at least three times a week if they're going to gain competency and start to use that skill when they actually do feel bad. So, so I would put that on the to-do list for this summer. I would also encourage us to work on playing collaboratively and sharing. So, so um, this is a, an, 
a relatively advanced uh, skill at this age. We see a lot of parallel play in four-year-olds where they play next to each other. But, but around the time they're starting kindergarten, the kids will start to play more collaboratively. And it's a beautiful thing because they, their language skills really explode when they're talking more with each other. Um, so observe the child where they are um, in that transition from parallel to cooperative play and sometimes open-ended play materials like dress up clothes or, or, um, or blocks are, are the best ones that you can see that collaborative play occur. Um, we want to also teach our teach our children how to how to be in the same space with other children. So, you know that you don't you don't say um, you want to speak kindly to your friends. For example, you you don't want to um, touch other people's belongings unless you're invited to. You know you don't want to drink from someone else's water bottle. These very practical things. Sometimes. Um, Sometimes children have been in a social environment. This comes easily. Other children just need to be taught about personal space and the idea that um, you know we don't always get in people's in people's business. Um, can your child say uh, no, please? I don't like it. I need help. These um, sort of self advocacy skills are great in the classroom. And um, one thing that we want to do is is make sure that we have given our, ch our children some guidance about um, private parts and things like that. So when I talk to parents about that, I, I typically say that, you know, when, when it comes to you as, when it comes time for your child's exam in the pediatrician's office and the doctor is looking at the private parts to do a thorough evaluation, it's a great opportunity to be like, only, only the parent and the doctor can ever touch your private parts and you can't touch other people's either. Um, because when the children start going to the bathroom together, they can get into mischief and make people uncomfortable. So we don't want that to happen. And those messages are really best received from a parent. I, 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 I have to say, increasingly, we, we push these academic skills on children and there's a lot of pressure for a child to know how to write and to read um, when they're entering school. Um, but this is just a reminder that children typically aren't ready uh, to write well right at the beginning of school. The hand um, X-ray you see here is from a, a three-year-old and then an eight-year-old. And so what you see is that uh, the, the bones aren't even fully developed in the wrist. Um, the, there are bigger areas of separation. There's just not the manual dexterity that the children achieve later on. So um, sometimes, you know, we we do our best to teach um, to teach literacy and pre-reading skills, but but they may not master handwriting right away, and that's okay. Um, these shapes are are sort of the developmental milestones for how children. Uh, learn to write and you, you know once they can get to a triangle that's when they're starting to get closer to writing letters certainly if a child is having more difficulty um, after the after they get started in kindergarten there's always more resources to help so if we have a few few more months to go um I, well, I would skip the worksheets and writing work and instead focus on work to just strengthen those fine mu muscles in the hands um, working with Play-Doh or slime um, is a great way to, to use all the different muscles they'll use in writing. Working with small objects like beads, obviously with supervision, so nobody puts them up their nose, um, is a great way. Uh, lacing or sewing, those sorts of work are great to build the skills that children will later use to write. Um, instead of just talking about uh, letters, um, naming letters and, and writing letters, we want to talk about uh, the sounds we hear and what words start with and end with. That's sort of like a phonemic awareness, which is a great building block for learning. We can talk about rhyming. And these go with songs and, and are more playful and engaging for children, too. Um, the other thing I, I mentioned, actually, counting toys and snacks as a great way to teach about numbers. The other one is talking about what comes first and what comes last sort of introducing ordinal numbers in that way, the first, second, and third. Um, and talking about more and less as concepts. Um, those concepts are very fundamental to math skills of kindergarten. So um, because, 
we we have the summer ahead. You know, these are the things I'm going to do with my daughter this summer. I'm going to encourage her to play outside a lot and climb and and build her core strength and and exercise so she can sleep well at night and stay active. She's going to be like independently putting on her socks and shoes and and um, dressing herself. Uh, even if it takes longer than I want it to, we're going to be reading lots of books together um, and talking about those stories as we read them. And and I think my other favorite activity is to have children help in the kitchen. There's a lot of math and science that occurs in the kitchen. There's a lot of opportunity for fine motor practice with mixing and scooping and cutting. Um, and it's just, it's also helpful to me uh, and exposes her to new flavors and foods that that build a healthy diet. So those are, um, these are the activities that I recommend most at this age. In, um, in uh, pediatrics, I, I have to say, I think the one most fundamental um, health metric is sleep. <laughs> when a child isn't sleeping well, they may have difficulty growing, regulating their emotions. It won't be able to focus on learning and, and it can make the parents' uh, life really difficult as well. So it's very common that in the summer, or we may get off schedule and we'll, we'll have the kids going to bed late and, and waking up late because maybe they don't have anywhere to be in the morning. Um, so if that's the case with the family, uh, to know you can only adjust the routine by about 15 minutes a day. So a couple of weeks before school starts, to start getting on the school schedule will help set your child up for success. Because, you know, again, if they walk in that first day overtired, it will be a lot um, more difficult for them uh, to, to separate, to, to enjoy their new environment and to learn. I would also say that it, it's common, some four and five-year-old children still need a nap, especially if their family routines are such that they stay up later in the day. We aim for between 10 and 13 hours of sleep at this age. Um, and sometimes if children are going to bed, you know, late, they may, they may need that rest time in the afternoon still, and that's okay, but it's difficult to work in with the school schedule. So what we find is that school is more tiring than what most kids do before school. And as a solution there, you might need to move bedtime or dinner time earlier, which can be difficult with working parents' schedules, but can sometimes make a big difference in how the child feels and, and uh, impact the behavior in tantrums. The other common experience parents have is that at the end of the school day, um, their child kind of unloads on them. And part of it comes from fatigue, that, that they're tired after a big day. Part of it comes from being hungry because often around this time of pickup, they, you know, it's time for a snack. Um, but part of it is also because children hold in um, big feelings at school. And then at the end of the day, they just kind of collapse. Uh, so many parents have that experience and then they say something bad's happening at school my child doesn't like it what's what's wrong um but but often this is just because they they feel safe with their parents and they they want the support and connection from their parents so it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem um so you can always check in with the teacher and make sure that they're well regulated during the day but but don't be surprised if this happens um the, you know, the other thing that I should have put a slide in here about is about um, toilet training. And uh, because speaking of holding in, many children are hesitant to use uh, restrooms in new places or with new, new people around. And we do want to encourage children to use the bathroom at school, both for pee and for poop, because we can get some really bad constipation when children hold it in all day. So, so it's probably a good idea to talk to your children about that at some point. So um, I, I did, you know, my background being in complex care, I've helped a lot of children over the years with, um, with uh, medical conditions, learning issues, developmental issues. And, um, and these are sort of the things that might need a little bit more uh, time or preparation for the school to handle appropriately. So even though school is still a few months away, it, it's a good idea to reach out and sort of understand the process. So if your child um, might need to take medication during the school day, you know, if your child has food allergies or um, a history of having seizures or, or blood sugar problems, those, those um, 
conditions often require um, a, a safety plan, and and it it's it's a little bit of work to get it in place um, and to learn the system in which you're working. But we want to make sure that a child uh, their medical conditions are well managed during this transition. So there might be a form or a, or an extra prescription that needs to be filled to be left at the school. Uh, even though it's a couple months away, it's a great time now to start working on that. If um, if you think your child might have difficulty navigating stairs or or the bathroom or the cafeteria independently, um, that might be a sign that there might be a need for a developmental evaluation to see if your child might need help with um, physical or occupational therapy as part of their school day. Um, and, and that just might take some time to get in place. So if you get those evaluations started, now um, the school can be better prepared to assist your child. If your child um, has difficulty expressing their needs or language skills, same thing. Um, we, we know that speech therapy uh, can be a really important part of learning for children and it can take some time to get those services in place. So if, if that's an important priority, um, I would definitely reach out to the school where your child will be going and get that process started. Um, same thing with mobility. You know, if there's equipment that your child uses to get around, it may require special busing and things like that. Um, if your child has struggled in, to engage socially with other friends or has had difficult behavior, we know that it can take a few months to to connect with the appropriate resources in the community, whether it's a therapist or or a, a, an evaluation by a psychiatrist. And so, I always recommend you to, to jump ahead on these things. Um, and and even if you're not sure if you're going to need that level of support, you can always make an appointment now, and then in two months, kind of readdress when the appointment comes up. Uh, because what happens is. Uh, if you wait, and then you have to wait even longer for an appointment. And, and those professionals can make such a big difference, but they're hard to access. So we try to think ahead about these needs. And uh, the, the last bit here is about the home environment. So many families, you know, they have financial difficulties. They may have, uh, you know, changes in the, the family structure at home, whether it's a divorce or a sick loved one or, or um, or a housing transition where they're staying with friends for a while in between places. And, and when these things come up, I, there's a, a, a family often tries to keep these things kind of private and not tell the school. Um, but what, what I would say as a pediatrician is, is often um, it helps, it's best for the child when we communicate openly about these things. Because if there's something hard going on at home, sometimes the children, um, may misbehave in the classroom environment because they're stressed or they're tired or they're sad. And if the school um, knows about the context, they can provide more appropriate support and really partner with you as a parent to make sure your child has everything they need to, to uh, thrive. And, and school can be particularly a safe, happy space when this is happening um, and a consistent space too. So so don't be scared to reach out to the school if you if you might have some difficulties at home. They might not be able to, to really fix it, but they might be able to help you locate community resources to, to, to help support your family. Schools are often great resource hubs and um, know, know a lot about other things in the community. Uh, so just a reminder that it's a lot uh, to get a child together to go to school, right? I talked about a lot of things, the emotional skills, the practical skills, the, the learning skills. Um, and, and it might feel a little overwhelming, but, but you're not alone in this transition. You know, you have your doctor if there's any health concerns or, or if you're not sure if there are some developmental or emotional problems, you have the school. And it's really an amazing gift to your child when you're able to, um, when you're able to have, um, as a pediatrician, I always breathe a sigh of relief knowing that there are skilled educators uh, uh, working with the children I see because as parents, we don't always have the um, experience with knowing what other five-year-olds are doing and what's normal for other five-year-olds. And, and your, your school often does. So they can provide um, really great context about how, how your child's doing, what you should be focusing on and things like this. Um, and it, it's just a little back and forth as you get to know each other. So um, a new system 
um, sometimes can be difficult to navigate or sometimes things can come off wrong or miscommunications can happen. Um, but just remember to assume the positive intent that everybody is aligned um, with the goal of helping facilitate learning and, and having a good experience. And so while they're getting to know your child, you know, figure out the best way to communicate. Some teachers, you know, they don't have time for email or, or talking because of the long school day. Sometimes it's by writing. Sometimes there's an administrator in the school who sort of handles these communications. So take the time during your school orientation to ask, who do I contact if I need something? If, if the pickup plan changed last minute or my child misses a day, you know, learn how the systems work so you can facilitate this important communication. Um, and this is just a picture of my daughter and, um, and a reminder to say, to just enjoy this milestone in your child's journey. And, um, and on that note, I will, I'll take a look at the questions and, and see if I can open it up. And I'm happy if this is easier for you and for everyone to hear the questions, I can read those off. The first question is from Rick Foster. How do you approach the assessment and addressing of specific social, environmental, and economic factors that may make it more difficult for parents and families to accomplish the key pre-K steps you have emphasized in your presentation? Yeah, the, the, this is a really great question. Um, and there are a few, there's a, there's a great book out there. It's called Parent Nation by Dana Sufkin. Um, and it talks about, it talks about how sometimes we haven't set up our systems to really support all the important work that parents do to prepare their children for school. You know, it, it's, it's hard to afford, a, you know, high quality childcare for working parents and to have the space and the time to, to do this work. So so what I lay out here is very lofty in terms of like what I wish every child had access to, but in the real world, um, sometimes we have to prioritize. And, and we might also acknowledge that during certain seasons of a child's life, they might have more or less, you know? Um, so that that's part of why in, in the summer break, it's a great time to focus on the social and the emotional skills because there might be more space in the schedule. There might be family vacations or travel where you, you have a moment to really reflect on your child's skills and to think about how to help them take the next step of developing those skills. Um, it, you know, the Child Mind Institute has also a great website with some more uh, content that I frequently use for parents about how to, how to kind of know what, how to respond to your child in, in difficult moments. Thank you so much. We have a couple other questions from parents. One parent says, my question's about transitioning my son from a full day daycare we, where he gets lots of good school prep and lots of unstructured playtime to a standard kindergarten where time is much more structured with far less outdoor and indoor play. I'm worried about that big difference. Anything specific to help ease that, that transition? Yes, I, I, I lived with that with my son, actually, because the school he went to for kindergarten, they didn't have much outdoor space at all. And so he was in that building all day. Um, and so sometimes there are really fixed uh, elements of the school like that. Um, I would encourage you to, to ask when you have an opportunity to go into the classroom or meet the teacher. Often educators are very aware of children's need to move during the school day. And they incorporate that into the learning activities, even if they're not necessarily leaving the classroom, they may have people move around the classroom intentionally. They may do little games within the classroom to get the kids to get their wiggles out so they can focus on their learning. But I, I feel certain that all the kindergarten teachers, they, they think about um, ways to incorporate um, movement into the school day. So, so hopefully that will be enough uh, to, to kind of meet your child's needs and, and they can also get some playtime in after school. A few other questions and keep them coming. These are great. How can I best support my son who has a color vision deficiency in K-5 when colors are so prominent in the curriculum? You know, I, I've, I've been debating this with so, so many pediatricians in my community that in some ways, I wish that we just screened children for colorblind or color color deficiencies because it is very common. 
there are a fair number of kids out, out there who have trouble differentiating between red and green. And so when I have children in my practice like this, I always recommend to tell the, to tell the teacher because just like you said, it, they don't want to say, take out your red folder and have the child to get confused. And often, um, often uh, there, there are ways to, to work around this and adjust the materials, you know, take out the folder with a triangle on it or something like that. So, so it's a great uh, opportunity for communication to ensure the learning is appropriate. What resources would you offer for children to build up self-advocacy and emotional strength? Yes, uh, you know, there's, um, there is a, a, a children's book on this called, no, uh, I think it's called No Trespassing, but, but it's a little bit about how children can be in charge of their own, their own body. And it, it's like a scaffold for parents to talk about, um, you know, because a lot of times children, we, 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 when we bring them around our families, we say, hug your grandmother or, or we kiss them and we don't give them options about how we handle their, or we're going to tickle them and they have no, no control over their body. So the very basic um, step of teaching a child about consent um, and, and being able to say, no, thank you. I don't like that. I don't want to hug or giving a child an option and how they greet someone with a wave or a handshake or a hug. Um, I think these are little ways in which we can um, we can kind of prop up our children in respecting their own bodies and their own preferences. Um, so, so that would be, that would be one step. What are some tips for handling frustration when children become frustrated when trying and learning a new task? And I think this may have come from a parent or from a teacher. About a third of the people today are teachers, and many are teachers who are sending children off, uh, pre-K teachers. So what could teachers and parents do to help those children handle frustration? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I always say you have to name it to tame it. <laughs> so um, I think the first step is for a child to identify that they're getting frustrated. Um, so, and because the reason that matters is because if we can um, identify it earlier before we get to like a 10, we can potentially use some of those coping skills um, to take a breath, take a break, um, uh, take another approach. Um, but if we get to like a, I, we talk about like an emotional thermometer sometimes. So like we learn new skills, like in the five to seven zone, but when we're at 10, we're like, we're, we're in panic, we're in crisis, we're in tears. It's difficult to learn then. So identifying, you know, when you're getting frustrated and then, um, identifying specific skills that the children can use, like, um, like taking a breath, taking a, using the, squeezing your hands, uh, asking for help, these sorts of, these sorts of specific skills. So I'm going to answer, ask another question in just a moment, but for a moment, I want to be a mom. I have three children of my own. And this weekend, my daughter had a complete meltdown and she is a third grader. And I tried the skills that we had learned for her as a second grader and third grader, and they bombed. They didn't work at all <laughs> because she was in that 10. And then I went back and I used the skills that her three-year-old kindergarten teacher had taught us and they absolutely worked. And it was just so beautiful a moment. And I just wanted to take this moment to recognize and honor the gifts that three-year-old and four-year-old preschool teachers give to little children that last a lifetime. Um, so thank you. And thanks for really acknowledging the, the value of this work. The next it's question- It's so true. Sorry for the moment of personal privilege, but, um, you know, I just thinking about thinking about that as you spoke today. Um, so the next question is, how do you transition a child or children into a school if they've never been to a daycare? Because a lot um, of that has been going on, especially when you, uh, you know, are moving to that bigger grade. I'm sorry, the questions are jumping around. So I lost it. Yeah. But that's the core of the question. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know that's why that's why I was talking a little bit more about the schedule and the, the sleep and the expectation setting, right? To know that that the you know as you think ahead to the fall schedule, the change of school is huge for a child, right? So so it's not going to be a time when you're going to want to sign them up for soccer and dance or or make play dates every day. 
your child might just need um, to focus on school being the big the big activity uh, for a while and and might need extra rest time after uh, and extra um, time perhaps to connect with with their routines and their familiar objects as they scaffold into school. So if you set the expectation that like it might be a little hard, but and it might take you know even as long as six weeks for the child to adjust to the new routine. Um, but but they will get there and you will too. And and then they will have this whole rich uh, community that they're part of. And there's a lot to look forward to in that transition too. So the, the other piece of the reality of that is, unfortunately kids get a lot of colds the first year of school. So if you've managed to miss daycare and preschool and all those colds, you may be in for a lot of colds next year. So <laughs> prepare. And sort of merging together two themes from this transition, uh, these transition questions. One person is asking um, about that transition, specifically thinking about uh, the larger numbers of children and also being in a group where there are older kids, right? So, you know, you've got the four-year-olds and five-year-olds, and then there's fourth and fifth graders who are adult-sized. Um, so, you know, what tips do you have on that? And then merging that together with just a, a basic question of helping make sure that your child is safe. Yeah. Yes. Um, I will say that I think it's really nice for children um, to be exposed to older kids because I think they look up to them and they learn from them and they're role models for them. And sometimes we'll see children who resist doing things with their parents or with their educators, but then when they see another kid doing it, they gain um, motivation to do it. Um, so I think the big kids are far more helpful than they are harmful. Um, and often it can be a really lovely, um, it can be a really lovely connection point too, when they show support to the younger kids in school, uh, they can also feel like leaders. So uh, I would not worry too much about the bigger kids being around, but, but this is part of why I mentioned earlier about um, having the confidence to speak up. I have had kids who, who maybe haven't practiced, maybe they're shy and they're not uh, comfortable speaking up when they need help or or something's wrong, but um, for it's just important for them to know that if they need help, they can ask their teacher for help, and if their teacher can't help, they could ask another grown up, um, and they can say, you know, they can say stop and no and these things, and and someone will help them. Um, I think the school is a very safe place. I think for, for a lot of parents, especially parents who might have had um, trauma at some point in their journey, uh, it can be scary to be separated from your child and, and to have strangers around your child or unfamiliar people. But, but if we look statistically at, at, um, at school environments, they're, they're very safe spaces where we have a lot of trained professionals providing exceptional uh, you know, care, developmentally appropriate care to children. So so safe, you should know that your children are probably safer at school than they are at home. <laughs> we have a lot of questions left and we only have about two minutes. So I want to do two things. First, I'd like for you, many of these questions are specific questions. You know, my child uh, has been recommended for OT, but I'm not sure if I should do it. We had a bad experience in kindergarten. Should we re-enroll in kindergarten again? Um, you know, should should my twins be in the same class or separated? If you want to answer any of those, great. But also, as you do, would you mind sharing where can parents turn in their own communities? And I'll give a plug. One place parents can certainly turn to is their local first steps as a resource. But where else are some places that parents can turn to to get some of these specific and really pressing questions answered? Yes. Well, you know, I... I talk to parents about these things every day as a pediatrician. And the nice thing about a pediatrician is that they know your child's kind of history and, and health and your family and your values and your goals. So they might be able to help um, make some of these decisions or at least frame the, the facts um, so that you as a parent can make a decision that you feel confident about. I, I think the other thing is some of these decisions, the hardest part is that, that they, we lack certainty, right? There's no one way. Um, some twins would probably do better in the same class and some would probably do better in separate classes. And we, we just can't um, be sure. 
And so we, we, we have, sometimes we just have to cope with that feeling of uncertainty and give it a try and see how it goes. Um, and I think when it comes to deciding whether or not somebody needs an evaluation for therapy or to potentially repeat a grade, I, I, I think in those, um, in those moments, the, uh, the I always recommend getting the evaluation. So if you're if you're considering repeating a grade, that's a child that, from my perspective, should go back to the pediatrician and have a comprehensive chat about the development. How's the vision? How's the reading skills? Um, is there a reason to screen for a learning disability like dyslexia? Is there emotional dysregulation that might require uh, working with an OT or a therapist? Uh, we want to set that child up to really succeed next year, regardless of what grade they're in. And, and the best way to do that is to get more information and do a thorough evaluation. So, so the schools are great resources, the pediatricians. Um, if your child is coming from a 4K or a preschool program, um, those teachers kind of before you leave are great resources to say like, if we, what should we focus on next school year? What should we do differently next school year? Or what should we do over the summer to, to pre prepare? Um, so all those people um, are, are out there to help you. And thank you so much, Dr. Frayden, for your time today. You've helped all of us navigate this important transition uh, with some skills and tools in our tool belt. We so appreciate you and your time, and we will all give you a virtual uh, round of applause. So thank you. And now thank I'm going to so move much. on to an exciting uh, celebration for all of us across the state. We are celebrating that this is now the 20th year of Countdown to Kindergarten in South Carolina. Developed by South Carolina First Steps and our partners across the state in 2004, the initiative includes programs and events all across the state that help children and families prepare for that transition to school. So to tell us more, we have Dr. Janice Kilburn, who is the program director for Countdown to Kindergarten right here at South Carolina First Steps. And Janice, I'm going to turn it over to you to reflect on what we've learned over the past two decades. That's great. Thank you. And hi, everybody. You know, as I sat here listening to all the good information from Dr. Fragan, I couldn't help but think, well, no wonder we've been around for 20 years because <laughs> a lot of the important information that she gave us about the importance of getting good information and resources and being in communication with key people and that all kind of circles back to relationships in some way is the foundation of Countdown to Kindergarten. So before I get started, I want you to know we have served probably about 18,000 children in South Carolina in the past several years. The last year being the largest year with just shy of 2,000 children in only one year. But Countdown to Kindergarten is a kindergarten transition program, and it is when the child's soon-to-be teacher and um, child and parent or caregiver get together, get to know each other. There are five sessions um, where they do fun activities that are linked with the South Carolina Kindergarten Learning Standards. And so this is an opportunity for parents to learn from the teachers about what kindergarten expectations are, because we know that, and, and we saw some questions in the chat too, that that's what they want to know. Are my, is my child um, going to be able to measure up? So in those sessions, they're, they're fun sessions, but at the core is helping parents understand kindergarten expectations and how to support learning at home. And um, probably even bigger than that is that the relationships are formed. And like Dr. Frayden said, you know, kindergarten transition is a leap of faith. It's going from the unknown to the known. So in those five sessions with those key people getting to know each other, um, a lot of that, a lot of that is just taken care of. And the sixth session, I'll say, is at the school. And again, lowering people's anxiety because now they can see the classroom. They can understand um, where the child will be eating lunch, where's the bathroom, and so forth. So in a nutshell, that's Countdown to Kindergarten. It's expanded a little bit. We now have Countdown to 4K for rising 4K students. And we have Countdown with supports for uh, children with disabilities and for multi-language learner families. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Kilburn. It's now very exciting to be able to announce the first five winners of our drawing. We have a wonderful partnership with Marine Toys for Tots Foundation, who has committed 10,000 books for children throughout South Carolina. So the giveaway today is your choice of 10 free books through that Toys for Tots Literary Literacy Program. Uh, we're gonna do five now and five at the end, so please stick around. Uh, we also have an amazing speaker uh, who we're gonna queue up in just a moment. If you'll look to the chat, you will see your name there if you're one of the five winners. And there they are, look at that chat, congratulations. And while you're celebrating your uh, big winning here, I do uh, want to ask Dr. Kimberly Jordan to please turn on her camera so that I can introduce her. Dr. Sorry, Dr. Kimberly Johnson, I apologize. So Dr. Kimberly Johnson uh, is originally from Shelby, North Carolina. Dr. Johnson is a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She holds a master's degree from Clemson and a PhD in curriculum teaching and leadership from Northeastern University. With more than two decades of experience in education, Dr. Johnson has served as a college instructor, and educational coach and a motivational speaker. She is also the author of 22 children's books, inspiring young learners to discover their love of reading and learning. Dr. Johnson. And I think we cannot Hello, hear Hello, everyone. There we um, go. Thank you so much. Thank you for that uh, nice introduction to this amazing opportunity that we have today. Um, I want to just kind of say, to piggyback off of what you said earlier, uh, Georgia, about the value that these educators bring to our space. It's incredible. And we cannot have this conversation without thanking them for all of the great work that they do, because without them, we would not be able to help our babies transition into the great space that they need to be in. So giving a total <clears throat> shout out to our teachers and to parents. You are the first teachers in their lives. So we cannot even start this conversation at all without saying thank you, fair parents, for being committed and for following through and making sure that your children get the best of everything they have. Because when they come to us, they are really an empty cup. When we give birth to these babies, when they come into our lives, however they come into our lives, they are coming to us as empty cups. And it is our job to take everything we have to fill them up with the great stuff. So I'd like to start with a piece that I wrote called Simply Empty Cup. Children like an empty cup look to us to fill them up with purpose and with praise. And if we do our job just right, it lasts throughout their days with lessons about life and learning from a book, planning what is best for them and knowing where to look, taking time to stir with patience and with grace, showing that you're interested by looking in their face and saying no is OK, too. It's just a part of growing. Sometimes things don't go our way, a lesson much worth knowing. But if we teach them hope by reaching for their dreams, they gain the faith to not give up despite how tough it seems. So listen with your heart and encourage with a smile. A perfect blend of all of this can last them for a while, at least until they're confident and we find them all grown up. And just to think our work began with first an empty cup. So let's celebrate early childhood and let's celebrate the work that we are doing, not only as educators, but as parents. Remember this, parents, educators, and advocates have the ability to change. Yes, the word change. We have the ability to change so many things, not only in the children's lives that we serve, but also the children's lives that are a part of our lives. We can change a mind. We can change the direction. We can change their future, their life, their environment, a situation. We have the ability to do that by the way we engage with them, interact with them, and most of all, the way we encourage them because because that truly can make a difference in who and what they become. Speaking of change, indeed the world has changed, but it is not where we are right now. It is where we will go. And so my, if I have to give an overarching message today, I would say to you parents, educators, just go. 
This is my kindergarten picture. Yes, I know I was a cute little kid. And of course I had a big bow in my head because something about the South, you gotta put a, put a big bow in your hair. Um, and I laugh at my girls now. These are my babies here, and I'll tell you about them in a second. Um, when I get them all dressed up, I try to slap that bow in the top of their head, and they're like, Mama, it's too big. I'm like, we're in the South, girl. It's got to be big. So I plop that bow in their hair, and, and we go off to wherever we're going, and they look fabulous. But this is where I grew up. And by the definition, I was considered poor. You know, if you look at the, the dynamics of what society and what the definition of poverty says to us, this constituted me as poor. But here is what I've learned if I haven't learned anything else. Everything I needed, I got from that house. And here's the thing. I didn't know we were poor. It wasn't until everything around us deemed us as poor that I realized that that was the label that was attached to, to who I would be and who I could be in that moment. But that does not mean who I ended up. And that's what we've got to think about as we are making this journey and this transition. It is not necessarily where our children are in this moment that will define where they go. Because if we keep pouring into them, we keep inspiring them, we keep motivating them, we keep surrounding them with positive things, they can supersede their circumstances. So this is where I grew up. I learned everything I needed to know in that house from my grandparents who raised me. I didn't live in a traditional household setting. I had grandparents who raised me because my parents were not available for me at that time. And uh, I look and think about how my grandfather could not read or write. And my grandmother had a third grade education. But in all honesty, you all, they were the smartest people I ever met met because they understood in order for me to be successful, they had to rally that community together. And that's what they did. They had Head Start programs. They had church programs. They had other early childhood programs that were available to them for that time that allowed them to be successful. And so I knew that they were setting that path for me because they were being smart enough to find the people in the community who could help them. Fast forward, uh, my husband and I adopted two years ago now, uh, these beautiful girls that you see here. So that's right, y'all. I am Sarah from the Bible and my husband is Abraham. How y'all doing? So we adopted these babies and I thought, what have I done? Uh, because they, are, they were four at the time. And so I had to sort of relearn all this. My husband and I never had children of our own, but we've raised many, many children over the years to include my college students as well. But we decided, you know what, this is the part of our life that we don't want to miss. So we jumped in and, and decided that this was going to be our path. So we adopted these beautiful girls, Jesse and Allie. And um, I remember when we first adopted them, the first thing that popped into my head was I need some help, I need resources. And I re remember reaching out to, and I'm gonna give a shout out to our York County First Steps. Um, I reached out to David Liss and, um, and to Cindy, uh, uh, Cindy, let me get her last name because she'll get me if I don't do it right. Uh, Tom and Kimmel, I'm sorry. Uh, so Cindy and David really helped us figure out what we needed to do. And they pointed us in the right direction. So I do know that First Steps is powerful because they gave us our jump start that we needed. And I took these girls back to where I grew up because I wanted them to see that no matter what your circumstances were in that moment or are in this moment, this doesn't define who you are. So I think the big message that we have to know as educators and as parents is that even though we are going through things right now because the world has changed tremendously. We still have the opportunity to inspire and motivate and encourage our children to be the best that they can be. Because by all definitions, I should not be on this screen as Dr. Kimberly Johnson. I should not be a college professor. I should not be an author of books because I was not deemed to be that. However, I had an early childhood educator, my Head Start teacher, and there's so many more other than those programs. I mean, anybody 
anybody I say who goes out into the early childhood field, they are alpha in my book. And that means they're the beginning. So it doesn't matter what program you're with. If you are an early childhood educator and you love these children that we serve every day, you are alpha in their lives. And that means that you are the beginning of setting that tone of whether they're going to love education. Parents, you're the one who sets the tone of whether they get out and get up in the morning and get out that door and decide if they're going to love going to school. And because I had those people in my life who inspired me, they did not see me as a little brown girl who couldn't go out into the world and do great things. They saw me as a potential leader. So if I have to implore you to do anything, educators and parents, start seeing your children as leaders in the world because we need great leaders who are going to step up and step out and create greatness in the world. So if we have to think about what does it mean to encourage young leaders, we've got to make sure that whatever we're pouring into them is the stuff that they need to go out and make the world better. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I always pray two things. Number one, Lord, thank you for another day. I get a chance to get it right today. The second thing is, is that I always pray that I can make today better than yesterday. And that's all we can hope for as parents and educators. Even when you have a bad day with your child and those days will come, you get up the next day and you go out there with the hope and the desire that today will be better. Teachers, you're not gonna get it right every single day, but every day that you are blessed to get up and you go into that classroom or you walk into that setting or that center, you have the opportunity to get it right that day. But every day is an opportunity to start building these great leaders. And they start with the youngest of children that we serve. So I'm going to make it plain. You know, Dr. Fradel did such a great job on the research stuff. And I love research and that's cool too. But I'm very much a realist. And I think that sometimes the stuff that we need to do is go back to good common sense. And good common sense will direct you. But my grandmother used to tell me, baby, common sense ain't common. And she was right, because sometimes common sense seems like it would be easy to get to, but sometimes we still are challenged by that. So let me try to give some common sense to what it means to build those youngest leaders. And I basically took the word leaders and I broke it down listen to our children. You know, research is telling us that young people are getting involved in adverse behavior because they feel that people are not listening to them. So we have to start as early as we can listening to our children, hearing what they have to say and letting their voice matter. You know, in my household, there are certain things because I still think you have to have a line of the parent and the teacher. And I have negotiables and non-negotiables in our household. The negotiables are the things that I'll listen to. I'll let you tell me what you think and why we should do it. And the non-negotiables are the things that I have to do as a parent or I have to do as an educator to protect and keep them safe. So listen to your children, give them the opportunity to share what they want to share, but also keeping an open mind express your pride. Oh my gosh, this is so important. I'm so proud of you. Look how great you did today. You rock. You're amazing. Thank you for sitting and listening. Thank you for helping. These kinds of things will encourage them and build that confidence and self-esteem. And we need to make sure that if we're going to build leaders, they have to be confident that they can do it. Allow them to make mistakes. We are imperfect people in an imperfect world. That means that none of us, by grace and mercy, we are here, that we are all going to make mistakes. So allow your children to make mistakes, but learn from those mistakes in a positive and productive way. Deliver different ideas and opportunities. Give your children a chance to engage in things that they may not typically engage in. Give them opportunities to listen to things they may not listen to. Let them listen to different types of music. Let them engage in different types of activities. Those may be different cultural activities. Let them engage in those because that's going to give them opportunities to learn about others and be more tolerant as we grow and become great leaders. Empower through autonomy. Giving them the opportunity to do things by themselves is going to build a strong leader. If they're tying their shoe, and they may take a little bit longer than you'd like for them to because you really got to get going, just give them that extra 30 seconds to try it on their own and then you help them. But allow them to be autonomous because that allows them to realize that their decisions can be valid and they can do things powerful in the world if they just learn how to do it by themselves. And that means we're there supporting, but some Sometimes let them try it. And if they don't get it after a couple tries, then step in, but let the autonomy live. Review and repeat. 
again. Every day we wake up, pray for let today be better than yesterday. So some days we're going to get it and some days we're not. But we wake up, we review what we did the day before and repeat the good things that we did the day before that helped us and keep adding to those. And finally, if you want to build strong leaders, start over when needed. Sometimes we get all the way through and then we got to step all the way back and then start over again. So when we do that, we understand and recognize that we are all a work in progress. So let's build those young leaders and leadership starts very, very young. The younger we start, the more opportunities we have to build that. And every day, every day is an opportunity to teach. Yes, I love teaching. I, I never thought I would be an educator. I was going to be a television anchor woman, right? I was going to be uh, the next Oprah Winfrey. Got into television and I didn't like it so much. I realized that I had a stronger voice doing what I loved, which was writing. And that's why I became a children's author. I was a journalist and now I'm a children's author. And then here I am as an educator. And I think what a great path. But again, if my grandparents had known, but my grandfather used to always say something to me because he was an amazing teacher. Even though he wasn't educated, he was smart. And he used to always tell me, if you get it up here, nobody can take it from you. And that's powerful. If you get it up here, nobody can take it from you. And what he essentially was telling me is you, if you go out, you get your great education, you learn how to be the best person, the best human being you can be, then everything else will line up the way it needs to in your life. And that was a lesson I've never forgotten. So think about what you're teaching your children every day. Are you teaching them to go out and be good human beings? And then are you teaching them to go out and become brilliant and bright learners? Because those things are all valuable to who they can become. But teaching is what we do. Parents, you're the first teachers. So we salute you for giving the time and the energy and the love and the late nights and the sick times that your children don't feel like coming to school, but you take off work and you're there and you're supporting them and making sure they're healthy and happy. We salute you for being the great teachers. For our educators in the classroom, in the home settings, in centers, we celebrate you because you teach every single day you walk into that space. But sometimes we have to be reminded, what does it really mean to truly teach every day? I'm gonna make it plain, as plain as I can. Number one, T, talk the positive. Encourage your children by the words that you use. I'm proud of you. You're smart. You can do this. That supersedes anything we can do as educators. Because if you pour into them, you are giving them something called structural thinking. And that structural thinking sets the foundation of who they can become. Because if they believe that they're a good person and they can be great people, they'll start operating on that expect success. Stop lowering the standards. Expect your children to do great things. Show them how to get there and encourage them and support them and expect that greatness because we can all get there if we just line ourselves up for that. Accept your challenges. Y'all, it's not going to be easy. Some days are going to be tough. Some days we're not going to feel like doing it. But if we get up every day and say, you know what? I can make it. I'm going to do it. Yesterday was tough, but today I got this. And when we can say that, we're going to encourage our children to get out there and keep trying. And it will build that thing called resiliency and grit that helps us get up even when we don't feel like it. Because as adults, we need that too. Accept those challenges. Mother Teresa said that sometimes we feel what we do is a small drop in the ocean, but think how little that ocean would be without every single drop. So every day you get up and you go out there, you're accepting the challenges and you're dropping more into that ocean of knowledge and success. And C, create space of joy and reflection. Have a space in your home where you can just sit and talk about the good things you did. It used to be the supper table. That's where we did that. But you know, we've got busy lives and we've gotten away from it. And as a new parent, I'm starting to learn, I've got to create that space because the world will tell me it's got to be something else. But I've got to take charge of that and say, this is the space we're going to have today. Whether it's on a couch, on a corner, um, on the sidewalk, wherever we are in our yard, in our house, that's our space. And that's where we 
rejuvenate that joy and reflection. So parents find that joy and reflection. If they saw a caterpillar, sit down and hear the caterpillar story because that could be that moment of joy and reflection. And you've got to remind yourself to do that because life gets so fast for us and we run out of time. And before we know it, we will run out of time because our children will grow up and they'll become the adults that we hope that they become. And so really take that space and reflect. And then five, the fifth part of it, help each other. We're here. No man is an island. This group here today, this opportunity is an opportunity for us to ask questions, to share, to get to know each other better, and to really introduce our children to how great the world can be. Yes, change has come. The world is a lot different. It's so much more different than it used to be, but we also know that we are better for the change that we are facing right now. We have the opportunities to grow, to connect, and to learn from each other. And that is the power of what being an early childhood advocate, educator, and parent is. I wrote this quote here. When we begin to see the beauty in our children, we recognize the beauty in the world. And that is a powerful statement because I think about how sometimes we see things in the world today that are ugly to us. But if we look in the face of a child, if you ever feel like that things are so dark and you just don't know which way to turn, I want you to find a young person and I want you to look into their face because that's where you will see the beauty of what we still have to work for. The things that we are leaving a legacy for, our children, our futures, our communities, our world, we are the legacy as educators, as parents, as liaisons, as facilitators, as anyone who is committed to celebrating early childhood, we are given the opportunity to leave a legacy. And every day I wake up, I pray that my legacy continues to grow and that one day I can look back and see that I did do something in the world that made a difference. If I didn't make the world a better place by creating something or writing a thousand books, if I was just making the world better by being a better human being, then I've done something. And that is what I want my legacy to be. So I charge you with this, parents, educators, what is your legacy? This is my legacy. Thank God for the past for it brought me to here. 2023, a fantastic year. Sure, there'll be challenges, that fact remains, but without those struggles, there can never be gains. Our children, the future, born from the past, a moment in time, don't they grow up so fast? Can we give them the guidance that great leaders give? Can we show them the wonderful life they can live? Can we help them build futures right from the start, start supplying their needs from their minds to their hearts? Yes, we can, because hope is the hammer and trust is the nail and faith will guide us when everything fails. You see, we are the legacy upon which they will grow and we can move their lives to a higher plateau. We're here for a purpose and we're here for the good and we will change their lives as all great educators should. And when our days are done and the battles have been fought, the legacy should say they lived what they taught. They lived what they taught. So every day we are modeling for our children how we want to see them live in the world. We're more tolerant, we're more loving, and we're more caring of each other. That's how we raise great children to be not only wonderful educators, but also to grow up and be great human beings. And that, my friends, is what early childhood educators do. Here's just a little taste of some of my books. These are the ones that I kind of uh, just love sharing with early childhood folks because I think they send messages that support good character. They talk about how to be kind and help and share those messages that are so much a part of the academic uh, road. Because if we teach our children how to be responsible, how to take care of things, how to care for others, the academics will come with it because they'll be more responsible in the classroom. They'll listen more. They'll work harder to be great students. So teaching them to be good characters will lead into the, the academic sides of it. And that's what we have to continue thinking about. So here's how to get in touch with me. I also want to share this with you uh, before I entertain any questions. Um, 
this is one of my apps. It's called Everyday Coaches 365. You see the little emblem here because we are all standing on each other's shoulders of success. And this is just my way to keep pouring into my educators and parents. Uh, I'll drop activities on there. I'll put just motivational quotes. I'll put things on there that will inspire you to stay on this journey because it is a journey. Um, there's no charge for the app. It's just a way for me to say thank you for all of the hard work that you do every day. Dr. Johnson, thank you for the heart work that you do and the inspiration you've brought to all of us for sharing your own story and for gifting us this as we go into the rest of our week and into a new year pretty soon here. I don't see any questions in the chat, but the chat box is absolutely filled with gratitude, with thanks, with celebrations, with agreed comments, with hearts. And I think that outpouring uh, that you are seeing in the chat box is just a reflection of how much you've touched all of our lives today. Absolutely. And there were a couple of people that asked about the link. I will share that again for you. Um, and my website, let's see, let me go back here. This is the website, simplycreativeworks.com. And this is my email, everydaycoaches at gmail. If you have any questions or you want to get in touch with me. Uh, and I think because every day we are coaches, parents, you're coaches. When you get your kids up and get them ready for school, come on, we got to go. Come on, let's load up. We're ready. What's going Let's do it. And I use that same energy as if I am coaching them every day to get them to the car. I coach them out of the car. Woo! Go to school. Have an awesome day. You rock. You rock. And I do that. And then I get back home and I'm sleepy. <laughs> but we got to do it because that's what's going to inspire them. And teachers, when you open that door, come on in. Today we're going to learn. This is our space. We're going to make it great. That energy becomes contagious. And then they get excited about learning. So make sure that you are coaching them every day to be great leaders, to be great listeners, to be great learners, because that's what we do. And then uh, this is the link for the uh, Everyday Coaches, or you can look up Everyday Coaches 365, go to your app store or play store to find that. Thank you so much. And those uh, links are there. Uh, we're responding to questions as they come in, uh, but we are gonna now transition as we conclude to our second giveaway. And um, it's a pleasure to be able to announce those winners in the chat. So if you will look down to the chat, here they are. So there's our winners in the chat. And again, just a special thanks to Marine Toys for Tots Foundation for this wonderful giveaway uh, and all that they're doing to support language and literacy development in our youngest learners across the state. As we wrap up, I want to give a special thanks to the team. They don't know that I'm doing this, but I wanna thank the team who put this together. I want to thank Beth Moore and Laura Baker. I want to thank Dr. Janice Kilburn and to our panelists who've spent this time with us today. It was incredibly inspiring and we just appreciate your gifts of wisdom and advice to all of us as educators, parents, and community leaders. You've joined us today at the 2023 Countdown to Kindergarten Summit. If you do have questions about credit, whether it's SC Endeavors credit, or I know as a um, former foster parent myself, I saw some foster parents on and I asked the question, can they get credit for this? So if you have questions for us about credit that you may need for other uses, feel free to reach out. We will be responsive. And if you would like to learn more about Countdown to Kindergarten, or maybe this prompted additional questions, resources that you are on the lookout now to gift, to share with your students, with their families, or for yourself as a parent, please visit countdownsc.org. We also have great printed resources that you can access there, posters that you can hang in your schools and in your classrooms, uh, in your faith community. So we're trying to get this message out to all families all across South Carolina. Uh, please do visit that site and help us share these great resources all across the state. Thank you so much for joining us.